the royal standard flutters in the wind. This is living history, a deeply rooted tradition in full flower. The occasion is the state opening of Parliament, a massive display of pageantry with a living heart. Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip leave Buckingham Palace for the House of Lords, riding in the Irish state coach. Britain is famous throughout the world for her royal occasions. The Blues and Royals move down the Mall in strict formation. Pageantry is part of our royal heritage. The National Gallery, next to St. Martin in the Fields, looks out over Trafalgar Square with its fountains, a famous meeting place. The Queen's official residence in London is Buckingham Palace. Originally a private house, it's been the home of kings and queens for over a century. The Royal Mews at Buckingham Palace is a busy place. The ceremonial horses are prepared here for their glamorous public appearances. The gold state coach is the showpiece of the royal carriage collection. Its rich gildings, magnificent carving and painted panels are superb. The other coaches and carriages in the royal mews are kept in perfect working order. Trimmed in royal red and gold, they're constantly being used for ceremonial work and so down to the smallest detail, including the harness, they must look perfect. The royal family's love of horses is well known, and the Duke of Edinburgh is a successful competitor in his own right. Many of his trophies are on display. Members of the royal family take part in sporting competitions. This brings them very close to the public. Prince Philip has now given up polo, replacing it with the equally dangerous and colourful sport of driving teams of horses. These events are highly popular with the public. Here he is in the international four-in-hand competition in Windsor Great Park. This occasion is often attended by his daughter, Princess Anne, herself a notable rider. Horses are used to celebrate royal birthdays, pulling the guns to fire salutes in Hyde Park, and on many other great state occasions. St. James's Park, spreading out near Buckingham Palace, looks altogether more peaceful. There is a spectacular show of flowers all the year round to welcome visitors. Surrounded by all this colour and fragrance, it's difficult to believe you're in the centre of a huge city. <coughs> Kensington Palace is the birthplace of one of England's most famous queens, Victoria. She spent her childhood here, and there's a fine statue of her in the garden. Part of the palace is open to the public, but part is divided into private residences for members of the royal family, including the Prince and Princess of Wales. 
The elegance of the palace seems to spill out into the garden, a delightful formal arrangement of flowers, grass and water. Kew Palace, to the west of London, was a home of George III and many of his 15 children. The garden at Kew, with its famous Chinese pagoda, is of enormous scientific value. George III took a keen interest in the Royal Botanic Collection and plants were gathered from all around the globe. The Tower of London on the River Thames is a royal fortress. It was started by William the Conqueror after the Battle of Hastings in 1066. This castle was a prison and a place of execution. The name of the Bloody Tower reminds us of its grim history. Now it's a popular place for visitors with the yeoman warders or beef eaters in attendance. The White Tower, the central fortification of the castle, is the oldest building, dating from 1076. 30 miles away, to the west of London, the soldiers are on guard at Windsor Castle, where the royal family usually spends Christmas. Also on the Thames, it's another of the great fortresses founded by William the Conqueror and has been used as a royal residence ever since. On Sunday afternoons, you can wander into the courtyards and listen to a concert on the East Terrace. Windsor Castle is a huge place. It actually covers 13 acres. You could spend a whole day here just wandering through the courtyards. It seems as though every monarch who ever lived here has wanted to add to the castle or beautify it or modernize it in the style of the day. The magnificent state rooms inside the castle are continually in use. The banqueting hall was decorated to celebrate the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. And these rooms, with their priceless paintings and tapestries, are open to the public. Windsor's St George's Chapel was started by King Edward IV in 1475 and finished by Henry VIII almost two centuries later. It's also the chapel of the Order of the Garter, the oldest of all the orders of chivalry. The Queen's standard takes precedence over all the other banners. They're made of silk and they're the showpieces of the order. They have their origins in the battles of the Middle Ages. Windsor Town, nestling below the castle, is a fascinating community where visitors are always welcome. Fifteen miles downstream towards London is Hampton Court, a palace famed for its formal gardens. was built by Cardinal Wolsey, said to be the richest man in the kingdom. In 1514, it had 280 guest rooms and 500 servants.
Hampton Court even has a royal ghost, said to be Henry VIII's fifth wife, Queen Catherine Howard. Leeds Castle in Kent has been called the loveliest castle in the world. Built on an island in the middle of a lake, it has a dreamlike quality which makes it quite unique. It has a history as a lady's castle, for no less than eight royal queens owned it during the Middle Ages. Leeds Castle is the base for an Anglo-American charitable trust dedicated to medicine and the arts. But the rooms are a living museum of the furniture and tapestries of the medieval period. Dating from 1787, the Royal Pavilion at Brighton is the most fantastic of Britain's palaces. It was built for the Prince Regent, who became George IV. His hospitality was legendary. Here he feasted his guests in splendour. But it is said that he once sat in the huge kitchen where the food was prepared and ate a meal with his servants, surrounded by all the copper pots and pans. Some of the most beautiful and romantic scenery in the British Isles is in Wales, and the eldest son of the Sovereign has been invested with the title the Prince of Wales, in recognition of the heroic spirit of independence of the Welsh people. Their bravery in resisting conquest is marked by the number of castles which the Normans and the English built more than 700 years ago. Pembroke Castle is one. It was destroyed, like so many other castles, during the Civil War, but is now still a splendid ruin. The Civil War itself is enthusiastically reenacted in different parts of the country each summer. Various battles are fought with authentic weapons and costume. Conway Castle, not as old as Pembroke, is also on the water's edge. The massive turrets and towers once made it the most secure fortress in Europe. Building began in 1283 on the orders of Edward I. The town of Conway, which grew up under the walls of the castle, is a favorite haunt for visitors. Harlick is another Welsh castle where history comes to life. It has its own song, Men of Harlick, March to Glory, and the great walls are a monument to the men who built the castle. But of all the Welsh castles, Carnarvon is perhaps the most spectacular. It was a palace as well as a fortress, the very first Prince of Wales was born here in 1284. And it was here too that Prince Charles, the present Prince of Wales, was invested with the title by his mother, the Queen. On the far side of England, the rural county of Norfolk has its own strong royal connections. Oxborough Hall looks peaceful enough now with its charming red brick walls, gardens and moat. But the ill-fated Mary Queen of Scots was held here. Eventually she was executed by her cousin, Queen Elizabeth I. Mary worked many of these tapestries with her own hand. And there are other fine examples in the main hall. Many villages in Norfolk are identified by splendid wooden signposts, but these are special, for they belong to the royal estate at Sandringham. A hundred years ago, the royal family travelled to their country house at Sandringham by train. The old railway station at Wolferton, the nearest stop, 
is now a privately run museum. But this is no ordinary station. No expense was spared to make it as luxurious as possible for the royal passengers. The royal family were enthusiastic about travelling by steam train. As these old royal carriages show, they were fitted out in the greatest possible elegance. The royal coat of arms on the front of the train made sure that everyone knew that royalty was aboard. Indeed, some trains were named after members of the royal family. These royal relics of the steam age can be seen in the National Railway Museum in York. This is Sandringham, set in the heart of the West Norfolk countryside, an estate owned by the Queen. More than 200,000 people visit Sandringham each year. On summer days, when the royal family is away, the public can go inside or wander through classic English gardens. You can follow the well-laid-out nature trail through the woods, and children can enjoy the ecology lectures. As the seasons change, Sandringham takes on its own beauty. These wrought iron gates at the Sandringham entrance were given to the royal family by the people of Norfolk and the city of Norwich, so they're called the Norwich Gates. Tranquil Sandringham Church, where the royal family comes to worship when they're staying at Sandringham. The altar, cross and altarpiece are exquisitely made. The ancient town of King's Lynn, eight miles away, has its own royal connections, starting with the name. In the town's regalia rooms, you can see the replica of the exquisite King John Cup and charters dating back from King John's reign. This is King John's treasure chest, which he left at Rockingham Castle in Northamptonshire. Other royal relics include this great seal of Queen Elizabeth I. Rockingham is another of the castles built by William the Conqueror. In 1530, Henry VIII gave it to Edward Watson, and the Watson family live here still. A hundred miles away in the Cotswold Hills stands Sudley Castle. St Mary's Chapel at Sudley is the burial place of a queen. This marble monument marks the grave of Catherine Parr, the sixth and last wife of King Henry VIII, and the only one of his wives to survive him. This lovely monument is Victorian, but much of Sudley Castle is Tudor, and there are medieval remains as well. A few miles away, Barclay Castle has a macabre history, because it was here in 1327 that a king was murdered.
He was Edward II, the very first Prince of Wales. The castle has remained the home of one family, the Barclays, since the 11th century. No tour of Royal Britain could fail to include Scotland. The scenery is as regal a setting as any monarch could wish for. The Scottish bagpipes are similar to pipes found in all the Celtic countries in Europe. Queen Victoria liked them, and the Prince of Wales, who became Edward VIII before his abdication, actually played them himself. Their music seems particularly suited to the wild beauty of the Scottish Highlands. Edinburgh is the capital of Scotland, a royal city, and the visitors come here from all over the world. Her eminence as a city of learning is rivaled only by her architecture and famous gardens. Edinburgh Castle is built on a spectacular rocky crag. Some say there's been a fortress here for nearly 3,000 years. Now, it's the setting for the Edinburgh Tattoo. Thousands of people come each year to see this magnificent display of men, marching and music. is a vital element in the clan history of Scotland. From the castle, Edinburgh's Royal Mile runs out to the Palace of Holyrood House. This is where the Queen stays whenever she's on state business in Scotland. Mary, Queen of Scots, lived in this tower in the 16th century. But the palace was greatly enlarged and improved in the 17th century by King Charles II. As the Royal Palace of Scotland, Holyrood House is a jewel. But it is to the romantic castle of Balmoral that the royal family returns each summer for the holidays. Here, they can truly get away from it all. This is the much-loved family home for the Queen, where she can walk and ride, and where the woods provide good shooting in the season. It was given to Queen Victoria by her beloved husband, Prince Albert. It's built of Scottish granite, and the tower, which is 100 feet high, has a superb view of the surrounding hills. However, London is the capital city of Britain. London is the seat of government and the centre of the greatest royal pageantry. The wedding of His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales to Lady Diana Spencer was the most splendid example of glittering display, a celebration of the lasting bond between the Crown and the people.
the world focused on the event. And the balcony of Buckingham Palace. they leave for their honeymoon, the Prince and his new Princess of Wales are acclaimed. A new chapter in Britain's royal heritage. Uh -huh. 